So 1 Samuel chapter 16, we'll jump right into it here, of course, uh, you know, real quickly, uh, chap chapter 15 involved the uh, Saul's disobedience. Remember when he came and was supposed to destroy all the Malachites and he saved Agag the king and the best of the sheep and Saul comes and reproves him and tells him that you know, obedience is better than sacrifice. He says that you know, your, your rebellion and your disobedience here is worse than witchcraft. And he tells them that God has taken the kingdom from him and has given unto another that is better than him. And of course, we find out in 1 Samuel chapter, chapter 16 that that individual is David. And it says in verse 1, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long without mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from, being, from reigning over Israel? So you can see right away that Saul is very troubled by this. If you recall last week as well, when he was, God gave him the news saying, Hey, I'm going to take the kingdom from Saul and give it unto another. It said that he stayed up all night crying unto the Lord. And it seems like he still hasn't gotten over it. He's, still, he's, he's hearing this, and, 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 and he's still kind of carrying on with this mourning and feeling bad for Saul to the point where the Lord has to come and say, Hey, how long are you going to mourn for this guy? How long are you going to mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him? And he tells him, to, he says, Fill thine horn with oil and go, and I will send thee unto Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I provided me a king among his sons. And what we can learn from this is that when God moves on, so should we. When God moves on, so should we. You know, we don't want to get caught up in wasting our time on people that God has rejected or refused or that, that are out of sorts with God. We don't want to waste time on those people. I'm not saying we should, we'll see something about David here also later in the chapter that he was very compassionate towards Saul, even in his backslidden state. But at, at the same time, we have to also learn that we should not waste our time on people that God is done with. And, <coughs> we, you know, specifically we could talk about reprobates. I mean, that's probably the first thing that comes to everybody's mind. And go ahead and go over to Romans chapter 1. Let's go there tonight. But, uh, you know, and I'm going to bring it up because of the fact that we're living in a world where Christians are just falling all over themselves, tripping all over themselves to care about people that God has given up on. Yeah, right. oh. And they care about and they want to come across like they're so loving and compassionate and they're, they're trying to minister to a group of people and placate a group of people that are implacable. And what we see is that from the story here in 1 Samuel is that when you need to give up, when God gives up on people, so should you. And you shouldn't stand around and mourn and feel bad and, and just accept what, uh, the, the way it is. You're in Romans chapter 1, but our, you know, the word reprobate even is a word that's kind of fallen out of fashion, unfortunately, today, even in Baptist churches. But the Bible says in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 6, reprobate silver shall men call them. Again, re referring to individuals, referring to people. He says, reprobate silver shall men call them. Why? Because the Lord hath rejected them. That's what it means to be reprobate. It means to be rejected of the Lord. You know, and this is, you know, this isn't a new teaching. This is just something that's fallen out of fashion. Yeah. But it's, it's a fact. We're going to look at it that there are groups of people, there are individuals that God gives up on, that God rejects. Amen. And now it's true that God loves everyone at one point, right? But, you know, everybody, people can get to a point in their life where God actually gives up on them, where he turns them over to a reprobate mind, Okay. It's clear as day. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 21. It says in verse 21, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. So he's talking about a group of people. They knew who God was, but they did not glorify Him as God. Neither were they thank thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an, an image made like unto corruptible man, into birds, into four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Now, underline this in your Bible, if you don't mind marking in it. Verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. He's saying, look, there's a group of people, they knew who God was, they rejected Him, and they, wanted, they got into idolatry, you know, talking about making God into the image of four-footed beasts and creatures, that type of thing. And as a result, verse 24, the Bible says that God also gave them up. God says, oh, you want to give me up? Well, right back at you. He says he gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Here it is again, verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up. So two times already in this passage, we see that God has given these people up. And it says there, and he gave them up unto vile affections. In the preceding verse, it says that they were to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And what he's referring to here is homosexuality. That's what he's referring to. 
He says, unto vile affections. And homosexuality is a vile affection. Amen. You know, and I don't think I need to convince anybody of that tonight. Where it says, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And lust, and, and, and likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman uh, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. So he's saying the reason why these people are even involved in this gross sin, this vile affection, is what the scripture calls it. The reason why they're even into that is because God has given them up. Because God, they did not want to retain God in their own knowledge, so God gave them up to a reprobate mind. That's what it says in verse 28. And as in, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And what does reprobate re mean again? Rejected. rejected. A mind that has been rejected by God to do those things which are not convenient. You know, God gives up on some people. God turns some people over to reprobate minds to do that which is unseemly. And I'm not going to get into this, this you know, into this, uh, you know, I'm not going to trip and fall over myself to try and save people that can't get saved. Yeah. They cannot be saved. Okay? And we got tons of Christians out there today, that's exactly what they want to do. They want to mourn and weep. Now, I'm not saying Saul in this story is a reprobate, but I'm just pointing out that God had to come to Samuel and say, look, you need to quit mourning. You know, you need to get some Kleenex out, clean yourself up, you know, wash your face, and move on with your life. <clears throat> you know, we shouldn't waste our time on people that God has given up on or that God has, you know, is punishing even. You know, one example, of course, is the reprobates. And we could go on and on about that, and maybe we will at another time. But what about this? What about witnessing to people who are unreceptive? You know, we don't, we don't run into a lot of reprobates right now. I mean, they're out there. But we do run into a lot of unreceptive people. And I see a lot of people, they go out, they're trying to preach the gospel, and they end up trying to talk to somebody. It's just, I, it's clear as day the person doesn't want to hear it. You know, the, the, just the body language alone. You come to the door, and they're just like, they're just like, yeah. I'm like, hey, I'm from a Baptist. And the person's like practically pushing themselves in the door. They're like pushing the door back, you know. It doesn't get that extreme. But, you know, you see people, you can kind of get a sense of people who start, you can tell when they're not interested. And I know we want to give them a verse, and we want to give them a chance, but you know, sometimes I think we get caught up in wasting time on people who are just unreceptive, not interested. True. How about one particular group of people, the Jews? Everybody's getting it tonight, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's our two favorite subjects, the homos and the Jews, right? But it's true. It's what came to mind. We see a lot of people who want to fall over themselves trying to witness to the most, some of the most unreceptive people there are. I mean, we could talk about the Muslims. They're unreceptive. Any, any you know, person that's involved heavily in some false religion, you know, and the Jews is ju are just one example of them. People that just want to spend all their time, you know, trying to find unique ways to witness to, 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 to the Jews or to the, some group of people. You know, well, we only use the Old Testament. <laughs> and here's the thing. If you want to do that, go ahead. You know, be my guest. You want to go beat your head against the wall, feel free. But, you know, I, I've been soul winning for a while now, and I've never gotten a Jew saved. And I know other people who have been soul winning, you know, much longer than myself and have, never, have only maybe converted one or two Jewish people at, you know, one person at the door, another person through, you know, online videos or something like that. <laughs> but there's a lot of Christians today, they fall all over themselves for this group too, don't they? Yeah. They're going to take their missions conference over to, to Israel. Yeah. Probably the most unreceptive place on the, uh, on the face of the planet. We're going to spend all this money, all this time, all this effort to go over to a group of people. And it's not like they don't know who Jesus is. They don't care. They hate him. They blaspheme his name. And they, you know, and, they're, and go over to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. The Bible says in 1 John, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is an antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. The Bible says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. So you can't say they worship the same God. Because they don't. They don't have the Father. If they don't have Jesus, they don't have the Father, period. But he that acknowledges, acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. <clears throat> Look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 24. The Bible says in verse 24, When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather atonement was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. So, of course, this is the crucifixion of Christ, and the Jews are trying to get him to crucify him. He's going back and forth, you know, saying why he hasn't done anything wrong, you know, and then he just washes his hand and tries to play it off like, well, you know, it's not my decision. Well, it is your decision. 
But look what they answer. Then the Jews, it says, Then all the people said, His blood be on us and on our children. Those are chilling words. And that rings true. They said, hey, bring it on. We'll, we'll crucify the Christ. And if it's him, you know, his blood be on us then. And you know what? God takes you up on offers like that. God took him up on that. And how many, how many parables do we have to read about in the Gospels where he's saying, you know, the, 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 the Lord of the vineyard is going to come and destroy those wicked husbandmen and give it to another, you know, or just a parable after parable saying, look, they're going to destroy the city. Many shall come from the east and the, and, the, and the west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the kingdom of heaven, but ye yourselves shall be thrust out in outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing and, 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 and weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. I mean, he just said it over and over again that he was going to reject them because they rejected him first. <clears throat> so this is another group of people that, you know, you got the homos, everyone's fallen over themselves, saying not to... Uh, maybe they don't want to minister to them, but they at least are like, well, let's not offend them. You know, they certainly don't want to offend them. <clears throat> and look, these homos are implacable. You know, I am going to go off a little bit on these guys. They're implacable. It, there's no sense in trying to placate these people. You might as well just stand your ground and just let them have it. You know, and just don't give them an inch. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I know one pastor recently, his church member went and put an invite in a, in a, in a homo's door. Didn't know it was, didn't know, there wasn't like there was rainbow flags everywhere, or, you know, you know, whatever else is indi indicative of that kind of thing. They didn't know, they were just out inviting people to church, they left one in the door. This, this homo gets on Facebook and says, this church is targeting me, and is, is planning on holding a, a, a rally, is going to have a protest outside their church. And so far, last I heard, like a dozen of them are going to show up. So when a dozen are coming, that means really like four are going to be there. <laughs> They're going to be incredibly outnumbered, right? But this is, this is the kind of mentality that they have. So why give them an inch at all? You know, why, why bother at all? Try, you might as well just say it like it is and tell them, you know, they're rejected of God. Why are Christians, you know, falling all over themselves to try and get people saved who can't get saved that God has given up on? It makes no sense. Or why are they going to some of the most unreceptive parts of the world to preach to people that don't want to hear it? Why do, we get, why do we do it sometimes at a door? When someone's just like, hey, I'm not interested or whatever, even if they're trying to do it politely and we just keep insisting. You know, if somebody tells me, hey, I'm not interested, I'm like, all right, have a good night. I'm going to go find the guy that is, that is interested because I know the guy that's interested is out there. So, you know, someone, they're doing me a favor when they say not interested. I mean, they're not doing themselves any favors. It's sad. I wish they were interested. But I'm not going to sit there and, and, be like, and be like Saul or, excuse me, um, Samuel, and just, you know, fall down on my knees at their door. <laughs> Why? Why don't you get saved? Why would you listen to me? How long without mourn for this stranger, you know? Pick up, you know, get up off your feet and go to the next door. But people do this. They, they fall over themselves for people that God has given up on. And we could talk more and more about, you know, how God has given up on the Jews, members of other false religions. You know, I, I mean, I saw a guy who was just like going around and around with a Muslim Look, they, they, they'll, say all the, they'll say, they'll talk to you. But it's like if they don't believe that Jesus is God, there's nothing more to talk about. That's it. You I mean, you leave them with like, hey, well, you know, the Bible says he is. They already know what we believe half the time. The Jews already know. I remember I knocked on one of the, one of the uh, Jews, uh, a, Jewish, a Jew's door one day and tried to give him the gospel. And I just said, hey, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? And he just smiled at me and slowly closed the door and said, yeah, I'm Jewish. And just closed the door. <laughs> He said, of course, I'm a Jew. That's what he said. I was like, okay, I don't think you're going to make it. Hope that changes. You know, not because of your ethnicity. It's what you believe, okay? That's what makes the difference. But go back to 1 Samuel. I don't want to go on and on about that. But that's something, you know, he pointed out right there. Worth pointing out because of the fact that, you know, God is clearly saying here, Samuel, quit, quit, cry, quit being such a crybaby. Quit whining about, you know, the fact that I'm chastening Saul, that I'm dealing with Saul, that I've rejected somebody as king. Now, of course, Saul is still saved. He's still on his way to heaven. We know that. But he's rejected him as king, right? He's taken that position away from him. It says in verse 2, well, we'll pick it up in verse 1. He says, uh, Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And then we kind of see this, this response from Samuel is kind of, kind of makes you scratch your head a little bit. Kind of makes you think about what's really going on here. 
As it says in verse 2, as it says, And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. Now that's pretty interesting. That's a pretty strong statement. I mean, here you have the guy who anointed Saul. Who found, when Saul found him, you know, he took Saul aside and said, All the eyes of Israel upon thee, and exalted him over a very high position. Remember, Saul started out a very humble man, very meek man, very small in his own sight, the Bible says. And now, and then, so for, so for Samuel to make this statement, it really makes you wonder where Saul is at. Is this, is this Samuel just being overly dramatic? And I don't think that it is, because if you read on, it says, And the Lord said, Take thee and heifer with thee, and say, I'm come to sacrifice. So he kind of gives them an alibi. Right, he gives them a cover. Right, he says, well, you know, go there to sacrifice, but while you're there, you know, you're worried about what Saul's going to... He didn't say, like, oh, you're, you're overreacting, Sam. He's not going to kill you. He didn't, he didn't reprove him for that. It seems like the Lord here is like, well, you know, that might be true. So why don't you take an heifer and go make a sacrifice? I mean, this shows you where Saul's at spiritually. I mean, when he's willing to the point where, where he's even got the man of God wondering if he's going to come kill him. I mean, he, this is how desperate he is to hang on to power. He doesn't want to let it go. That he's even willing to start killing for it. And we're going to see that in his life. I mean, he starts throwing javelin at, javelins at people, and he starts hunting David. Like, he, he gets obsessed with it. Like, he can't let it go. So the Lord says, you know, hey, take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice the Lord. Verse 3, and Jesse called, and called Jesse the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint, un, uh, unto, uh, anoint unto me whom I will name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake. It came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably. So it kind of shows you there, now I'm not going to make a big point of this, but the kind of the reputation that, that Saul had, or Samuel had, as a man of God. When, when he, the man of God showed up, and it's like, you here peaceably, or are you here to rip face? You know, are, you, are, you, are you coming to play nice? or what? It's like, what did we do? You know, it's like, I don't know, what did you do? You know, it's one of those things. So anyway, I'm not going to go on about it. But he says in verse 5, uh, and he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice in the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come to with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked in Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. So he sees another guy. You know, remember what it says about Saul, that he was head and shoulders above all the other people of Israel. He was the tallest guy around. He was a big guy. And it just, everyone was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. He would be king. Because, you know, a king back then wasn't just somebody who sat around in, in, in funny tights and wore a wig, you know, and ate dainties. Like, uh, as a, when you were a king back then, you had a job to do. You had to lead people out into battle. You were, they were asking you to go fight wars for them and, and, and other things. So you had to be, you know, you had to be a man's man to be a king back then. So, you know, you can kind of see where, where, why Samuel might have assumed this. When he sees Eliab, he goes, oh, well, he's a big guy. He's got a good countenance. Obviously, this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord tells him, no, that's not who I'm choosing. Because it says in verse 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look down his countenance or in the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. You know, and this is something that we need to really kind of take home tonight with us. It's because of the fact that, you know, we, we as human beings, that's what we tend to do. We, we, you know, it's just, it's second nature, probably first nature. It's just the way we're wired. You know, we make judgments about people within seconds. We look at somebody, we look at the way they're dressed, you know, you look at the way they carry themselves, and you just start to make assumptions. And a lot of times those assumptions are right. You know, a lot of times you can tell a lot about a person just by the way they look. But here's the thing, you know, when it comes to the Lord, he sees deeper than that. Yeah. You know, God can look at somebody that we might look at and say, well... You know, I don't know that this person's going to amount to much or what's God get really going to do with this person. But God can look at that person and say, well, you don't see them the way I see them. You know, I see their heart. I see what kind of, what, 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 how they feel inside, what kind of a person they have, what kind of motivations they have. You know, how hum they might be a very humble person. You know, they might be a very, uh, you know, somebody that God can use in a mighty way, but they might not look at it. You know, I kind of talked about this, you know, on Sunday as well is that we have to give people time. When people come to church, you know, they might not always say the right thing. They might not look the right way. They might not even act the right way. They might say things that we don't necessarily agree with. But that doesn't mean they're involved in rank heresy and need to be run out of the church immediately. Okay? <laughs> I mean, it just means they need time to grow. They need to be told, hey, that's wrong. Here's why. And, you know, and here's the thing. Even if that person gets corrected, 
I mean, let's say somebody comes in here and, and teaches something a little off. Now, obviously, if they're teaching, you know, works-based salvation or they're teaching some strange, damnable heresy, yeah, they need to go. They need to be strong. They need to be rebuked sharply and shown the door. But if, you know, people are mixed up on things all the time. I guarantee if we went around the room and everybody in this room started to express the things they believe about the Bible, some of you would have disagreements with one another. You know, we would probably have, we would be at disagreement on certain passages. Does that mean we all have to, like, get, all agree on, you know, this, every doctrine must be exactly the same, we all must be in exact lockstep with one another? No, of course not. That's impossible. That's not realistic. So when somebody comes in and they believe a little strangely about something or they have some weird ideas, you know, don't assume the worst about them. Just assume they're mixed up, you know. Don't look on the outward appearance. You know, let God looks in the heart. God understands, you know, this person is just mixed up on something. And they have to be given time to grow. You know, we might see somebody come in who, you know, maybe they're not, they don't look the part. You know, they don't have the, the, the hair parted right. They're not wearing the suit. You know, they don't have this polished shoes. You know, I don't even have polished shoes. Don't look at my shoes, right? <laughs> they, don't, they don't look the part. But you know what? That doesn't mean God can't use them. That doesn't mean that if, with time, God you know, is looking on their heart and sees somebody that he can use. Because, honestly, the people that seem to have it all together, a lot of times are the ones that are most filled with pride. Right. And we're going to see, you know, one of the, that's, I mean, really, that's Samuel's pro or Saul's problem, isn't it? I mean, he's filled with pride. But, boy, he looks the part, right? He's the tallest guy around. He's the biggest guy around. He looks like he should be king. But he's filled with pride, and God says, well, I'm not going to use him anymore. He has his own ideas about how to do things. You know, he thinks Agag should be spared. I told him to kill the Amalekites. You know, God's more interested in somebody who has a humble heart. God cares more about attitudes than he does appearances. God cares more about somebody's attitude than the way they look. You know, we need to get this mindset. We need, to, we need to share this attitude with the Lord. We need to learn to look at people the way God looks at them. You know, and that's hard to do. Yeah. Trust me. I, mean, I have to look at you guys every night. No, <laughs> Some of you, it's really hard. No, I'm, just kidding. I'm totally kidding. Right, right, you know, you got to look at me too. But, you know, God, God cares more about the way somebody acts or what the, where their heart is. God's not so much concerned with the outward appearance. Now, that's not to say the outward appearance doesn't, doesn't matter, because it does. You know, we should still worry about, we should still care about the way we look, the way we present ourselves, but that's not the deal breaker. Yeah. I mean, what if somebody came in and, they, man, they just, they had it all put together. I mean, they got the, the sharp suit, they got the nice, you know, $120 Bible or whatever. They got, you know, they got the hair parted just right. They say all the right things, but then you start to talk to them and you find out that they believe some strange, damnable heresy. You know, uh, they, you know, they need to go, you know, or, or they're filled with wickedness. You know, they, God cares more the way, about the way people act, the potential that they have, than what they are right now. You know, sometimes we look at people and we just say, well, we just see them where they're at. And then we just say, well, that's all they're ever going to be. But God sees where people, what people could become. He says, well, they might not be much now. I mean, David's just a shepherd boy. I mean, he's just, you know, and by the way, you know, we, we romanticize that job. That's like the job nobody wanted. That was the job you gave to the person. You, like, who do we not want around most of the time? David, right? <laughs> That's the sibling they didn't want around. You know, David, the troublemaker, whatever they might have thought. I, I don't know. They say, get him, send him off with the sheep to go spend the night out in the cold and in the heat. Because he has to go follow the sheep. You might have be around. You might have come home for days. It was, it's not the glamorous, you know, job that, that you know, all the old oil painters try to make it out to be, you know, all these beautiful paintings of some shepherd. It's like, it looks real nice, right? Real romanticized. It's not a pleasant job following a bunch of dirty sheep around for days on end, right? So, I mean, people would say, David, pff, just a shepherd. You know, he's just out, he sleeps in the grass. Why would you, why would you want him? Because God looks on the heart. And we're going to see some things about David's heart tonight. But David was, you know, he was a humble person. He was a very humble person. I mean, go over to... Uh, We'll go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Keep something obviously there in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, but go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, David is a very humble person. He's kind of the exact opposite of what Saul had become. You know, he's like all the good things about Saul, except he doesn't go bad. You know, I mean, of course he wasn't perfect. He committed sin, you know. He had to suffer consequences for his sin. But God established him in his throne, and he didn't reject him. And David is a very humble person. If you consider, I mean, consider how David reacted 
to the possibility of losing the kingdom to Abimelech, or yeah, Abimelech, his son. Remember when, um, when his son rebelled against him and he had a civil war and, he had, and David had to flee for his life and he thought that was it, the kingdom was gone? Now, this, this is the same situation that is going on with Saul, right? Saul's been told, look, we're taking the kingdom from you. God's rejected you. And now even Samuel's not even coming around anymore. Samuel's like, I'm not, I'm done. We're done here. He, he says he didn't see him anymore until the day of his death. Now, the, you know, Samuel, or uh, Saul, you know, he was faced with losing the kingdom. And so was David. But they had two totally different reactions. And why is that? Because of their heart. Saul obviously was very filled with pride. He couldn't let it go. Wanted to maintain the position. Wanted to hang on to that. But David, you know, he wrote Psalm 34 when he was on the run from Abimelech. And he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The, sh the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. I mean, does that sound like somebody who's on the run for their life? That sounds like a guy who's he's saying, I'll oh, bless the Lord at all times. It sounds like Job. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh the way. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <clears throat> he says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. That's what, you know, God looks on the heart, and when God sees somebody who has a broken heart or has a contrite spirit, somebody who's humble, that's the person that God can use, not the person who's feel, filled with pride. God does not use proud people. And that's why we need to really guard against pride in our life because pride will keep us from being used by God the way we could be. Proverbs chapter 26 says this, Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? A man wise in his own conceit. He says, oh, I've got it all figured out. I don't, I, what, what, what were they told out soul winning today? I have no need for God. That's a man who's wise in his own conceit. And the Bible says there is more hope of a fool than of him. That's not good news for the fool. You know? <laughs> it's not like the fool's like, well, I, at least I beat somebody. You know? What's he saying here is that's, that's how bad it is for a guy who's wise in his own conceit. There's more hope for a fool. And a fool is pretty much hopeless. And he's saying, look, there's ho no hope for a guy who's wise in his own conceit, a guy who thinks he's got it all figured out, knows better than everybody, who, you know, he can, he can, he can render, re he, he's wiser than seven men that can render reason. You know, he, he, no one can tell him different. God can't use proud people. Because what we're going to find out real quick if we try to live the Christian life is that we're wrong about a lot of things. You know, I'm not claiming to have arrived by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I, you know, I've learned a few things along the way. I remember when I first showed up, boy, was I wrong about a lot of things. Boy, did I have to have the preacher get up and just rip face on me, rip my face in particular about things, and come to me and take me aside and say, hey, you did this, you said that, you need to fix this, you need to fix that. And, you know, I'm not trying to get up and say, well, and I was just so humble that I took it all, you know. But I'm saying this, if I had, you know, I, I'm not going to say I didn't struggle with pride and, you know, get mad and upset, stop my foot and march out and, and have to adjust my attitude along the way. But, hey, if I had just, you know, puffed up and just, you know, got a hard, a stiff neck and just hardened my heart and just filled with pride, you know, I wouldn't be here today. You know, and, and quite frankly, there's a lot of people in this room that wouldn't be here today either if they didn't have at least some humility in their heart. That when they, you know, they're being corrected, the preaching the word of God is correcting them, they make mistakes, you know, if, if they have a humble heart, they're going to get, they're going to take that correction, they're going to get things right, and they're going to move on and do great things for God. That's why proud people can't be used by God, because they can't take correction. And we're all going to find out that none of us is perfect. And as soon as you really start to live the Christian, try to live the Christian life, there's going to be a lot of things you say, well, you're going to read the Bible and go, oh, man, I'm wrong about that. Oh, I'm wrong about that. Oh, I'm wrong about that. Oh, I need to fix this. I need to fix that. There's a lot of that going on in the Christian life, especially early on in the Christian life. <clears throat> go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 20. He says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Jump down to verse 26. It says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. He didn't say any. He didn't say there's no noble. He didn't say there's no mighty. He said not many, though. It's not to say that, you know, a, a wise person, a very intelligent person, a very worldly wise, a worldly successful person can be, can, you know, they also can be used. But he's saying, by and large, it's not many. He's saying, he's saying to the Corinthians, look around, you know. 
You know, there's, there's no dignitaries in the building tonight, I, I don't think. Do we have a senator here? Is there, is there some kind of state representative, perhaps? Maybe a CEO? Is anybody here just a, you know, a big shot in the world? You know, that, I mean, that's what he's saying. He's saying, look, there's not many mighty called. There's not many noble. There's not many, uh, you know, many wise. He's saying uh, uh, not many mighty, many noble are called. Not many wise men after the flesh. You know, we're not, we might not be wise after the flesh, but we can have the wisdom of God. And he said, well, why is that? Why is that God has, why has God used these type of people? Because these are the type of people that aren't filled with pride. I mean, you, do you think maybe that some of these, these senators and these representatives and these big shots in the world, these CEOs, the people with a lot of money, you think they, they just might have a little bit of pride? A lot of times that's the case. Now, I'm not going to just, you know, paint with a broad brush, but it's going to be, it's gonna be a fairly wide broad brush when I make that statement because yeah. it's true. A lot of them are. You know, they get puffed up. They, they, they attain some, you know, achievement in life. They attain some status in society. And you know what? If other people around them lift them up and praise them and exalt them and desire to have what they have, that lifts a person up with pride. You know, and they might have a lot of the world's treasures and a lot of life's pleasures, but you know what they don't have? They don't have God. They don't have, they're not being used by God. You know, God, why? Because they're filled with pride and God doesn't use those type of people. God uses humble, meek people. People that will do things the way he wants them done. <clears throat> he says in verse 7, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. You know, God deliberately uses the base things. The world, you know, the world would look at us and just say, what a bunch of just unintelligent, you know, just buffoons in there. Listen to that old Stone Age book, that Bronze Age book, Bronze Age book. Bunch of dummies in there. Don't they know about evolution? You know, blah, blah, blah. They would, they would mock it, right? Yep. You know, and, and, you know, honestly, sometimes I feel that way. I feel like I am. I mean, who am I? <laughs> Nobody. You know, I'm a, in, the, in the eyes of the world, nobody. You know, I'm, I'm just some guy. <laughs> right? But God uses people like us to confound the things which are mighty, to, 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 to bring to naught which the things which are. And why does he do that? Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his, ple in his presence. Look, if God uses us in some way, you know, he uses you as an individual or uses this church as he already has been, and, you know, let's say 20 years from now, this church has knocked every door in Tucson. You know, that's a real po possibility. Yeah, if we keep going the way we're going, even if we don't get much bigger at all, we'll knock every door in this town. Amen. I mean, it's 2 million people. Phoenix, Phoenix did what they did, but Phoenix, you know, Tempe Church hasn't always been as big as it was. A lot of, that, a lot of those early days, it was a smaller church. You know, seven years ago, I don't even think they had, seven or eight years ago, they hadn't even broken 100 once. I got there. But they'd already knocked a lot of that map. A lot of that map had gotten done. So they're just faithfully going out week in and week out. And, you know, you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Look, that's a big deal. Because that's the Great Commission. To go out and knock every door, and to, to, to preach the gospel to every creature, that's why we're here. I mean, the world would look at that and say, well, you're wasting your time. It's stupid. But we understand what we're doing. We're going out there to preach, you know, the, the, the eternal riches of Christ to these people, to, to, to bring them to eternal life. I mean, it's the greatest work anyone can be involved in and and look if we accomplish that and we will i believe god willing if we do that you know who's going to get the glory not me you know i might have the marker in my hand i might print the maps you know you know what not you you know you're just doing what you're told just like me we're both we're all going out there knocking on these doors you know who's going to get the glory for that god because, you know, there's a lot of times, I'm sure there's a lot of days where we have to drag ourselves out there and make ourselves do it. But God's the one that's going to get glory for that. And that's why he uses people like us. You know, people that the world would look at and just say, nobody. And that's fine with me. <laughs> I'd rather be a nobody here and a somebody there than the other way around any day of the week. <clears throat> well, go on, go on back to 1 Samuel, uh, Samuel chapter 16. Look, God doesn't use proud people. God uses hum people, humble people. That's why he's rejecting Saul. He's saying, I can't use him anymore. 
That's why he's getting David, because we're going to see here that David has a very humble heart. It says in verse 8, Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before the Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen these. And Jesse made Shema to pass by. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And I love how it, it kind of, it, it, and it says, And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. Are, are, and he said unto Jesse, are, are here all thy children? I mean, you had to ask him. I mean, this is, I mean, Jesse is like, well, surely it's not David. He doesn't even think to say, well, I got one more son. He brings all these seven sons and passes before him and says, well, boy, that, that's strange. I could have sworn. I, I wonder why. He's like, well, are these all your kids? Well, no, I mean, I got David, but <laughs> I know what it, I mean, if it's not Shema and it's not, you know, these other guys, it ain't, it ain't him. That's why we have him keeping the sheep. You know, we can't even stand to be around him. You think telling me that guy's going to be king? And so it's kind of funny how that plays out there. Samuel said unto Jesse, Are these here all thy children? He said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. Now it's interesting that it, it makes a point of saying that. Because, you know, early it says, you know, God does not look on the outward appearance, Right? You know, God's not impressed with, you know, outward beauty. But at the same time, you know, because God looketh on the heart, and David has a very humble heart. But he's also, David is also, it says here, he was good, of a beautiful countenance, a goodly to look to. So, you know, he was a good-looking guy. You know, he, he wasn't, he was easy on the eyes, as they say, right? So what this shows is that we should also not dismiss people because they, because they're, you know, they, they aren't ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I try to put this as delicately as I can, right? But I mean, because people go to the other stream, right? They say, well, God doesn't look on the outward appearance. So anybody that has a decent outward appearance, obviously God can't use. No, that's not the case either. It's just saying, look, that's not where God puts the emphasis. It doesn't matter one way or another. It makes no difference to God. I mean, David might as well have had a face a mother, only a mother could love, right? And he still would have used him. Right? But it just happens that he was goodly to look to. And God said, I'll still use him. Because it doesn't matter either way. Because God doesn't look on the outward appearance either way. See, we, we think of that and we go, oh, you know, God only uses people who aren't going to be on the cover of you know, some fashion magazine. Right? No. It's, what it's saying is God doesn't care about it either way. It, doesn't, it makes no difference to him at all. Good looking, not so good looking, doesn't matter. God looketh on the heart. That's what matters most. And I already explained why. Uh, but he says uh, in verse 13, and Samuel, uh, well, verse 12, it says, And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all the beautiful countenance and goodly looked to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. I mean, you just put, your, put yourself in these stories. You ever just read the Bible and just put yourself there? Put you in the, the, the shoes of these characters? Imagine being the eldest brother here. Like, oh, well, you know, obviously, uh, <laughs> Oh, you're here to anoint a king, huh? Well, step aside, gentlemen. You know, and then the other, then the youngest, get, the second oldest gets up there. Oh, you didn't choose him. Well, obviously, you know. All goes through all seven of them. And then David, can you imagine these seven brothers? And they're going. <laughs> imagine Jesse, the dad, just being like. Oh. Just, it would have probably just, you know, flabbergasted him to see Samuel stand up and anoint David of all the people. I mean, we just read it. They weren't even considering him. Samuel had to be like, is this everybody? Are you sure? He's like, well, there's David. And now he's getting anointed. I mean, just, I love the Bible because this really happened. This is like real life drama, right? <clears throat> and so he said, he anoints him with the horn of oil in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So, you know, we'll talk more about this, this, the spirit of the Lord came upon David. You know, in the next chapter, he tells, uh, he tells Saul about how he, you know, he, he, he rescued a lamb from the mouth of a lion and of a bear. How he took a lion by the beard and smote him. I mean, that's, this David, I don't think he was exaggerating. He literally did that. Like, he beat up a lion and a bear. Now, I don't know about you. I know I'm saved. You know, I have the Holy Spirit. But I'm not taking on any lions. And I'm not taking on any bears. I mean, when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, I think there was, that was like a special anointing. Like, 
I mean, explain, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, you know, in the, in, the, in the story, but, I mean, that's why he's able to go and take a guy like Goliath. You know, he has the spirit of the Lord upon him. You know, and, that, and we'll get more into that uh, in a later sermon, but that's interesting to point out that he had the spirit of the Lord from that day forward. But at the same time, the spirit comes upon him. God then removes the spirit from Saul and it doesn't leave him alone. And it says in the, in the latter end of verse 14, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now, this can kind of throw people off a little bit. They could say, well, what do you mean an evil spirit from the Lord? Like, they'll think that, you know, but what he's saying here is basically this, that, you know, God is tormenting him. You know, it's not that he's, whether it was like a fallen angel or something, I, I really don't know. But I think it was just a spirit that God said, hey, your job today is to go bug Saul and trouble him. And when it says that he troubled him, you know, in our modern vernacular, that he troubled him, you know, that's like you have car trouble. Right? That's how we use that word when you have trouble. You know, I'm having trouble with this math problem. I'm having car trouble. I'm having trouble with this or that. When it's saying he troubled him, as we're going to read in the story, I mean, it was severe. I think he was, like, really plaguing him sorely. Like, it was messing with his mind. It, it was really bad. But what we see from this is that, you know, God allows evil things to happen to people. Yeah. In fact, sometimes God sends evil things. By evil, I don't mean sinful. I mean bad things like God allows God almost gets I don't know if malicious is the right word or vindictive but God definitely you know he's not playing nice with Saul at this point and you know you could say well that's not that's not very nice of God but this is God Amen. and before we ever judge God we should probably take a big step back and remember the Bible says that my ways are not your ways that my thoughts are not your thoughts that they're far, they're, my thoughts are much higher as the, as, as the heavens. And we can't, you may not understand this, but God knows what he's doing. Oh, and let's not be the type of people who say that the ways of the Lord are uneven, because they're not. God knows uh, what he's doing. But, you know, this isn't the first time God has done something like this in the scripture. <laughs> you can recall the story of, uh, in 1 Kings, where God uh, sends a lying spirit, right, to uh, Jehoshaphat. I think I'm getting the names right. Uh, Ahab and Jehoshaphat and he sends Micaiah the prophet and Micaiah tells him look I saw the Lord uh, he said behold the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets remember uh, uh, um, Jehoshaphat was saying to, to Micaiah said how long until you tell me the truth he had all these other prophets that were saying oh go to war go to war you're going to be fine you're going to win and then he says to Jehoshaphat says to Micaiah is there not an, an, a prophet of, Lord, of the Lord among here and he says, well, there's Micaiah, but him I hateth, for he, he prophesieth, prophesieth not good unto me. So he only wanted the Joel Olsteins around. He only wanted the guys that were going to tell him what he wanted to hear. So he said, well, you need to get Micaiah. So Micaiah comes, and he says, oh, yeah, you're going to be fine. And Joseph says, hey, tell me the truth, Micaiah. And then Micaiah says, you know, I saw the, the, the children of Israel as sheep scattered upon the mountains without a shepherd. He tells him, look, you're not going to win. You shouldn't go. You shouldn't fight. And he gets, you know, put, thrown in jail for it. And he says of the false prophets that were there lying to him, he says, now, the, now therefore behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning them. He's saying, look, the reason why these guys are telling you what you want to hear and telling you to go to battle with Ahab is because they're lying, that there's a lying spirit from the Lord, that God is, try, God is trying to deceive you into getting you to go do something that's going to cause you harm. So God does this from time to time. I mean, think about the example of Job. Now, Job, of course, didn't do anything to deserve what happened to him. He was the most righteous man of all the earth. He was upright in all his ways. But God allowed him to be tested. God allows evil to come upon his own people. And sometimes he even sends it, like in the case of Jehoshaphat and here in the case of Saul as well. You know, Saul got out of sorts with God to the point where he said, now I'm just going to start messing with you. You know, I'm going to send an evil spirit to trouble you. And, you know, we should take heed to this. We really should. And, and, and the, you know, Take heed, you know, lest you fall. You know, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. That's a, that's a law of the universe. You reap what you sow. Whatsoever thou sowest, thou, that shall thou also reap. You know, if you, it's like gravity. You're not going to get away from that. And it can work for you or against you. You can sow good things and reap good things, or you can sow bad things and reap bad things. That's just the way it works in life. And if we sow bad things, we are going to reap bad things. And if we're disobedient to the Lord, if we're God's children... You go read Hebrews 12 again. We probably all know it. He chasteneth every son whom he receiveth. There's not a son whom he chasteneth not. Right? 
God's going to chasten us because we're, none of us are perfect. But here's the thing. If we just, just like if my son, like he's going to do foolish things because foolishness is bound on the heart of the child. I'm going to correct him and try to get him to teach him and instruct him to do the right thing. But if he just goes into full out rebellion against me, you think I'm just going to throw up my hands and say, oh, I'll give up? No, I'm going to come down even harder. Now, now he's really going to get it. I mean, and that's the way it works with God. So we shouldn't get this attitude to just think, well, I'm saved and I can just do whatever I want. Yeah, you can, you're saved. You can do whatever you want. You can go to heaven. But you can have a miserable time on your way there. You can be like Saul and just spend the rest of your days troubled and then find yourself at a witch's door and then committing suicide. I mean, it, that's how his life ends. And why was it? Because he's full of pride, right? And, he, and, he, and, he, and, and God punished him for it. <coughs> And you know what's interesting about Saul, and I'm, and I'm just going to throw this out there, is that what was Saul's big sin here? But why is God troubling him? Because he's holding on to a position that is no longer his. He was told, look, you're not going to be a king. We're taking it away from you. And did he, you know, if he had been really, if he had been a humble guy, he would have said, well, you know what? Let me just, here's the crown. You guys do, you know, David can take over. You know, I'm just going to step out of the position. No, he hangs on to it. And he starts, you know, trying to kill people to hang on to it. And here's the thing. God is against people who hold invalidated positions. That's true. When you, you know, and we see this a lot today with people who want to call themselves pastors or even deacons who don't, or don't even make the, the most basic qualifications of like being married right. or having children, plural, yeah. or have committed some sin that would disqualify them, adultery, you know, whatever, you know, the, the, all these sins that they, you know, that happens all the time, by the way, you know, or, or get divorced, pastors who get divorced, get remarried, which the Bible calls adultery, right. and then continue to pastor. That's wicked. And I'm telling you something, God's against that person. God's not going to bless that ministry. God's going to judge that individual. And you know what? Here's the thing. And this is what we're going to learn from David. When people hang on to, to invalidated positions that they are not, they're not rightfully theirs, God's the one that deals with them. Not me and you. We're not the ones that are, to, you know, some guy, you know, on the other side of the country somewhere, you know, is, is pastoring or whatever, and someone wants to, you know, say, well, he's invalid. He's not, it's not our job to go on social media and lead a crusade against that person. That's God. If, that's, if that person's saved and is God's child, God will deal with that person. I mean, that's not, you don't see that happening here with Saul. I mean, let's read the story. Let's see how David handled it, Okay. When, 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 he, when you have a man like Saul who's hanging on to an unqualified position, he's unqualified for the position. He's been told, you are going to be, no longer be king. And he hangs on to it. And God sends this evil spirit unto him, right? And it says in verse 20, go to verse 21, and David came to Saul and stood before him and he loved him greatly. And he became his armor bearer. I mean, David just got anointed with oil. And was told, you're going to be king. And he knows what's going on with Saul. He know, everyone knows what's up with Saul. I mean, he's there to play the, the heart for him when he's troubled by an evil spirit. But he didn't, he didn't show up and be like, well, you know, you're sitting in my seat, buddy. That's not even your crown. That's mine. You should get out of here. You're not even, you're not even valid. Is that his attitude? No, he said, you know what? I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. And then we see that through the rest. You know, we're going to get into that later in later chapters. But he loved him. And he was moved with compassion for this person. And it just shows you the humility that David had in his heart. That even when he had every right to just say, well, I'm the anointed here, you're not. That even then, he just humbly served, just let God handle the situation and let God work it all out in his timing. And he learned some lessons along the way too. So that's the kind of attitude we should have. You know, when we see somebody who's out of sorts or doesn't li match up spirit or scripturally with the position that they're in, if they're saved, that's God's problem, not mine. You know, I don't feel the need to go out and invalidate other people's ministries or validate them. You know, that, I'll let God deal with that. You know, that's the attitude we should have. In fact, maybe we should just love that person and pray for them that they see the light and that God doesn't have to trouble them because God will trouble them. You know, I mean, if I, were, if I were to, you know, let's say I were, you know, I'm the deacon here. Well, let's say I went out and, and, and committed adultery or whatever, or, you know, but... Uh, I decided, well, I'm going to continue to be deacon here, and, and, and this would never happen, by the way. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't do that, for one, you know, but if, even if I did, Pastor Anderson, I, I guarantee you I'd be out here <laughs> so fast my head would spin. 
<laughs> but you know, well let's just say well let's just you know let's just say I was pastor here, okay? Just hypothetically, I'm pastor here, but then I get involved in some sin, I disqualify myself, and I just say, well you know what? A lot of other pastors have done it. They've done worse things, in fact. And I'm just going to hang on to the position. Everybody likes me. And, and let's say the rest of you are just like, well, you know, we've been with Brother Corbin for a long time. And, you know, he's doing a good job. And I know he had this, this falling out here and he had this sin. But, you know, that's in the past now. We're just going to let him continue to, to do that because, you know, we like him. Do you think God's going to look down from heaven and be like, well, so if you guys are okay with it, then I am too. No, God's, God is going to judge. God will deal with me if that ever happened. And that's why any, you know, real man of God, it, you don't have to worry about whether or not they're going to step down when it's time to. Because they'll, they'll want to do it, they'll, they will do it before it even crosses your mind. Because they, they're more afraid of God than they are of anybody else. They'll say, I just invalidated myself as a minister. I don't want to get judged by God any more than I need to be. I step down, I resign. That's what a real godly man does when, they, when they're faced with the facts. When they're told, look, you've invalidated yourself, you're disqualified. God doesn't need us to go on social media, you know, and go on some campaign against somebody. And that happens way too often. You know, I see it way too much on, on social media. But anyways, I'm not going to go on and on about that. What's interesting, let me close on this point, is that, you know, David loved him greatly, right? But it says that he became his armor bearer. And of course, we understand the story, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that God sends an evil spirit. And then he says, well, hey... The, and, uh, uh, well, I want to point that out too. Where, where was it? Oh, I can't find it. Oh, verse 15. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. It's like, I'm, I'm just, I don't know why I'm going here, but to me it's just like, yeah, duh. <laughs> like, boy, these guys are real, real astute here, right? Very perceptive, right? But he said, let, now our Lord, uh, let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit of God, uh, from God is upon thee. He shall play with his hand and thou shalt be well. And I want to read this because I want to make another point here. He says, and Saul said to his servants, provide me now a man that could play well and bring him hither to me. They bring Jesse or J David, the son of Jesse. And it says, wherefore would Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and, and, and took an ass laid and sent a bottle of wine. But anyways, it, you know, Saul, David comes to him and plays in the harp, and whenever he does, the, the, the evil spirit departs from him. And what we should learn from this is that music is an incredibly powerful tool for good or evil. People today underestimate the power of music to a huge degree, to a huge degree. This is, a, this is worthy of a whole sermon. I mean, there's more, there's, I mean, think about how much music is brought up in the Bible. Over and over and over and over again, music is brought up in the Bible. The book of Psalms is a book of songs. You know, it's one of the longer books in the Bible. The, the, there's, the commandment to praise the Lord is the number one commandment in the Bible. It's mentioned more than any other. Praise Him on the harp and the string and the psaltery and the cymbal, the high-sounding cymbal and so on and so forth. All these instruments, right? Even Satan himself, before he fell, it talks about in Isaiah how, how he was, had instruments, you know, tabrets were a part of his body. Like, he, he played music. He was a musical being. Satan is a musical, not a musical instrument, but a musical being. I mean, that's why you get you know, these rock bands that, that, you know, let me just clue you in. When they say we sold our souls for rock and roll, they're not kidding. <laughs> they really did. They sold their souls for that. And then they get these powers, you know, they, they, God gives people, or not God, but the devil will possess, the, I believe this, possess these people and give them these abilities to play the music the way they do. I mean, I don't want to go on and sound like you're thinking, boy, you're really out there, but it, it's true. If you, if you read about that guy, Robert Johnson, who remembers Robert Johnson, the old-time blues player from way back in the day? And people would say, this guy would come around, and he couldn't play guitar for nothing. Like, they would, they, he would get up in between sets when people who actually knew what they were doing were playing. They would take a break. He would get up and start to play, and these people would come out of the joint he was playing it and say, will you get him off the stage? You know, he's just up there making a racket. And then the legend goes, the story goes, that he just disappeared for a couple weeks or whatever. And he comes back and he can play the guitar better than anybody. And he goes on to become, to this day, like the, these, these professional musicians, like these big time rock and rollers, they look at the music that that guy produced after that and say, he's, he's like, it's hard for us to play it. He's that good. 
he went from not from people running him out of some you know podunk bar saying don't bother us with your noise to being one of the, just the most lauded guitarists of all time and he wrote a song called going down to the crossroads and i fell down on my knees and he, it talks all about how he made a deal with satan and he's he's saying song after song about having hellhounds on his trail how he's going to hell how he woke up in the morning and hello sweet satan I mean, the guy talks about it in his music. And you listen to these rock and rollers, they talk about it all the time about how they sold their... Snoop Dogg talked about it in one of his, his rap songs. Sorry about that, but he did. I can't remember what song it was, but I remember there was a song back, back in the day, right? Which, <laughs> Murder was the case, yeah. I knew somebody would know it. That's the one, right? Murder was the case that they gave him. He talks about how he made, you know, God or the devil, like, brought him back from the dead or something. I'm trying to make the point is this, is that people underestimate music. Big time. And why do we do that? Because we hear it all the time. You go into the bank, well, maybe not the bank, but you go to the grocery store, you just go about your life and you're just always hearing music all the time. You go to work, play your people are playing music, you get in your car, you turn on music. Just music, music, music. It's music just becomes this filler. Yeah, you can you go into parking lots now. You're like walking in before you're even in the store, the music's hitting you. And you know, and they, they know the power of music. They're like, oh, it's you know, it's eight o'clock, almost closing time, we gotta turn it to the upbeat station to get people moving out of here they they understand that and this is a, like a whole sermon in and of itself but it's we see it here we see an example of it here that when saul or excuse me when david played on the harp the evil spirit departed and saul you know was given some some uh, relief from his troubles music's a very powerful thing we should be careful with what we listen to we should be very careful with it because it can affect us Anybody who's listened to anything knows that's the, tr that's the truth. I mean, how many times have you sat out here, you know, and, and, and we've heard, you know, congregational singing, some song, you're reading the lyrics. I mean, it, it'll move you to tears. Amen. Often, you know, I mean, it, it happens to me. Yeah. You know, I, I'm like, what is this? You know, <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, or you'll hear some song, it'll get you all pumped up. You know, there's a reason why, you know, guys go to the gym and listen to the death metal before they lift. Da, 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 rah, you know, and they're trying to lift, their, you know, lift heavy. They get all pumped up listening to, to, to whatever, you know, because it, 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 it affects you. It has a real effect on people. So that's worth taking note of. We should be very careful about what we listen to. You know, and if, if it's between nothing and something that's not so good, I would take nothing. But uh, anyway, the last thing I'll point out here is... is um, the, just the, the timing of, of God, the way God worked in David's life. You know, David, when you think about it here, he's in the perfect position to learn how to become king, right? Because he's going to become king, but it says there at the end that he became Saul's armor bearer, right? So if he's Saul's armor bearer, he's spending a lot of time probably, you know, around Saul, seeing how Saul does things. So, you know, God, he's got him in this perfect position to kind of learn how to be king. So I thought that was worth pointing out. But what I really want to point out and, 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 and drive home tonight is the fact that he was compassionate more than anything. You know, David was a very humble and compassionate person. You know, he didn't hate Saul, even though Saul was an illegitimate ruler, and that literally really was sitting in his seat. <coughs> and it says there in the end of verse, uh, we'll just pick it up 22, and Saul sent to Jesse saying, let David, I pray thee, stand before me for he hath found favor in my sight, and it came to pass when the evil spirit was God, was from God was upon Saul that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. You know, we should seek to do good to those, even to those that are bad. You know, and that, that's what the Bible teaches. You know, we should love our enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and despitefully use you, that you may be the children of your father. For if he sendeth his rain upon the just and the unjust, and maketh the, maketh the sun to rise on the evil and the good. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't look at other people. Like, David could have looked at him and said, you know, I'm supposed to be king, and gotten a bad attitude and treated him poorly. But is that what he did? No, he played the harp. He gave Saul, he refreshed him through his playing. He did him good. You know, and he refused to touch the Lord's anointed. That's the way we should have. That's the attitude we should have. We should seek to do good even to bad people. Because a lot of times, that's what brings, makes bad people good. Sometimes that's what turns people around. When somebody, you know, is, is, is being mean to you or, you know, treating you poorly, you know, kill them with kindness is what I was told. 
I remember I was at a job once years ago, and I got all bent out of shape with something really stupid with somebody. And I went around, and I was like, can you believe what so-and-so did to me? They, I can't remember what it was, but it was really petty. And the person just looked at me and said, well, you know what? I learned not to sweat the small stuff. And he said, you should just kill them with kindness. And that was a lesson to me. You know? And that's the attitude we should have. You, you get more flies with honey than vinegar, right? And that's, that seems to be what David had in mind here. He didn't go, well, I'm going to go in there and tell Saul what's up. You know, I'm the anointed here. He's like, poor guy. You know, he's moved with compassion for him. He saw the, the hardship he was going through. And I think he just really felt bad for him. And he, he gave him some relief. So let's be like that. You know, let's, be, let's not be somebody who's proud and lifted up and can't be told you know, that we're wrong about something. Let's be somebody who has a humble heart like David. You know, could take correction and also be compassionate towards others, even if that person you know, is, is doing wrong. Let's go ahead and pray.